Hey everyone, welcome to day 9 of Advent of Code 2022. The puzzle today is Rope Bridge. In this video, you're going to see a time lapse of me solving the puzzles, and then afterwards, I'm going to do an explanation of all of my solutions, uh, both of my solutions, including code, as well as what I was thinking while I was sort of reading the puzzles. If you want to check out my code, that's going to be in the GitHub repository, which contains my solutions to all of the previous day's puzzles. You can check that out in the description below. There will be a link. And yeah, if I have a private leaderboard as well. If you would like to check that out, then the code will be in the description. Currently, we have about 34 people, so more people would probably be really exciting. Um, I invite you to join, check out the code in the description. And without further ado, um, here's the time lapse of me solving today's puzzles. Okay, so I actually managed to get on the global leaderboard for both parts of today's puzzles, which is really fun. Um, for the first part, I got ranked 92, and I was pretty excited at seeing that I actually got top 100 after I finished part one. So I was really motivated to do part two, and I managed to get it pretty fast, um, rank 25. So I'm really proud of that. I think the practice has really paid off with regards to um, speed. So you can see here, I solved part one in seven minutes and a half and part two in about 10 minutes. So that's pretty fast. Um, and I'm really happy with that. Um, you can see I got nine points for part one and 76 points per part two. So earning some points, maybe eventually I can get onto the actual global leaderboard, but that's a long way off. You know, that's, that's still a dream. Okay. So let's actually take a look at the puzzle. Today is day nine rope bridge. This rope bridge creaks as you walk along it. You aren't sure how old it is or whether it can even support your weight. So evidently we're walking across a very precarious rope bridge and we need to figure out how to model rope physics apparently to um, help us get across. So as I was skimming through the puzzle, I was careful to read each and every part because today seems like a pretty long day based on just um, how long the scroll bar is. So I was careful to read every part and not just skip directly to the examples. The bolded words do help a lot. So some things that I took note of were, um, well, first of all, I did look at the examples and it did seem like there were things moving around. It took about a minute to comprehend what was actually going on, but I saw, um, you know, a series of motions and then, you know, head and tail of the bridge, sorry, of the rope. Um, and there's two knots on this rope. And then I kind of looked at what was happening in the examples and it did look like there was a sort of um, simulation of a rope going on. Okay, anyways, um, what's going on here is there are a two knots. There are two knots on this rope, and they are moving around in space, um, two-dimensional plane. So the head is the thing that's actually moving, and our puzzle input is giving instructions for how to move the head, and the tail is going to follow behind the head. So here are the conditions on what the, head, the tail must do um, with regards to the head's position. So the head and the tail must always be touching. So if the head moves, the tail must follow. Touching means adjacent either diagonally or like being in the same row slash column. So queen adjacency essentially, um, or the tail can actually be on top of the head. That is also allowed. So you can see here, um, there are a few examples of what is allowed, uh, what, what counts as touching, um, if they're immediately adjacent or diagonally adjacent, or the head covers the tail, all of those count as touching. So the tail must always touch the head. And here's what happens when the head moves. When the head um, is in the same column or row as the tail, then the tail just follows as you would expect. But if they are not touching, then the tail is going to move diagonally to track the head. So you can see here, if the tail is diagonally off and the head moves, you know, one unit up, then, then the tail is going to move diagonally to get as close as possible to the head. It's not going to directly like go under the head. That's not going to happen, but rather it's just going to move diagonally if it can to get into the same column or the same row and get as close as possible in the other direction. So what we need to do is sort of simulate this and I'll talk through my code and hopefully that'll, uh, Hopefully that'll also clarify what's actually going on with the movement. But what we need to do is simulate all of this moving around. And eventually what we need to do is figure out how many states the tail has visited, how many unique states. So we need to simulate this, keep track of the tail's position and count up all of the positions that the tail has visited at least once. So in the example, um, you know, there's this sort of diagram and we see that the tail is moving to all of these positions. And there, in total, there are 13 positions that the tail has visited. I'm moving to 13 unique positions, and that's going to be our puzzle answer. So let's take a look at my code. It's a bit complicated, so we'll need to break it down slowly. Um, first, we're going to read the input. The input today is actually pretty simple to read, unlike the like stacking crates day, 
I believe that was day five, and the puzzle input was actually sort of like a drawing that we had to parse, and it was easily, easier to parse manually than automatically, which is um, sort of rare for these kinds of puzzles. Um, but today's puzzle is relatively easy to read in terms of input. We're just given all these instructions, which mean either move left, move up, left, sorry, left, up, right, or down, and how many units in that direction the head should move. Okay, so what we're going to do here, our general plan is to keep track of the coordinate of the head and the coordinate of the tail. We're going to have some update function that's going to update the position of the tail for a given movement of the head. And that's going to contain a bunch of logic that's sort of like uh, a unit, so we can use it as a function. And then we're just going to simulate all of this, um, breaking down composite steps such as move left by two into move left by one, and then move left by one. So all of our movements are just going to be one step in any direction. That's going to be an assumption necessary for our move function. And then at the end, we're just going to, you know, simulate all of the moves and tally up the positions that the tail has visited. So that's sort of the breakdown, um, the overview, the outs line of my solution. Um, but there's some details here that we should look at. So first of all, um, the tail must always be touching the head, um, and the tail does not move if they're already touching. So what we need to do is write a function to determine if two points are touching or not, either adjacently um, or like diagonally adjacent. So what I did here was I wrote a function that takes in four coordinates, the x and y position of the first location and the x and y coordinate of the second location. All we just have to do is check that they're overlapping in the sort of like three by three box. So basically, if their x coordinates differ by at most one and their y coordinates also differ by at most one, then these two points are touching. Now inside this move function, we're going to accept two inputs, which is which direction we want the head to move in, and I'm going to update a bunch of stuff and figure out where the tail moves. So first of all, there are global variables, um, bad practice, I know, but advent of code um, requires you to commit bad practices sometimes. Uh, global variables for the head and tail position, I'm just describing the head as hx, hy for the x and y positions, and similarly for the tail. So what we're going to do first is we're going to update the position of the head, and we only need to update the tail if they're not touching, which is why we wrote this function in the first place. And at this point, I think it might be helpful to draw a diagram. So let's take a look. Um, we have TX and TY, which describes the position of the head. Um, and then we also have the position of the tail. It might be like down here. Um, we're going to assume the grid is of some dimension, but let's say some size. Let's say HX and HY um, is down here. So we know that the tail, which is actually up here, um, is not touching the head. So we need to update it and move it in this direction. But how do we know what direction there is? There are like eight cases that could happen here. Either they are like directly um, in the same row or column, or they're, you know, like that, or perhaps they're in one of these quadrants, um, in which case the tail needs to move diagonally towards the head. But how do we figure out this direction? There's a lot of cases to consider. Well, we can make it really simple just by looking at the direction. You know, um, we are motivated by that. So what we need to do is move like in this direction. And to get that, we can look at the difference between the x coordinates of the head and the tail. So if the head is to the left of the tail, then when we compute the difference in their, actually, let me take a look at my code. Yeah, this is right. If we take a look at the difference between their um, head and tail position, then it should be negative if the head is to the left of the tail, and it should be positive if it's the other way around. And it should be zero if they're in the same um, column. So this calculation, hx minus tx, is a really fast way of computing where the tail is relative to the head. And I'll actually just draw out the, the three cases here. So what's really going on here is there are three cases. Either the tail has to move leftwards to meet the head, in which case our calculation of the difference in the x coordinate is going to be negative, or it has to move to the right, in which case the calculation is going to be positive, or it's going to be zero, um, which means they're in the same column. So there's actually only a couple cases here, but we make the negative zero positive distinction because there are actually this many cases. So for the x and y coordinates, they are uh, roughly symmetrical. So we can actually just consider them in conjunction here. Let's consider a grid here. And um, these are exactly one unit apart. So let's say this is hx, hy, and this is tx, ty. <clears throat> so in this case, we need to move the tail to this position. And the difference in x coordinates is going to be negative one because the head is to the left. Um, let's say this is dx. And the difference in y coordinate is going to be uh, two because the head is above the tail. So we can see here that the magnitudes aren't always going to be the same when we calculate these differences. So the direction that the tail needs to move in um, should only be like one unit because the head is never going to be more than one unit away from the tail. 
because previously it was touching. So we do need to normalize though, because sometimes it can be two and sometimes it can be one. So a really fast way to do that is just to divide that difference. So that direction it needs to move in by the length of that direction. So two units is going to get scaled down to one, one unit and negative one is going to get scaled down just to negative one. Again, to summarize, the idea here is that regardless of how far away the head is, the tail should only move one unit in a direction because the head is never going to get that far away. So to normalize again, um, if this is zero, actually, we just, you know, make the direction zero because we're going to need to divide by the magnitude. We're just going to turn it into division by zero. That's not allowed. So if the if they're already in the same column, then we can just say it needs to move zero in the x direction, the tail. Otherwise, we scale down by however much the actual difference is. So in like the case of two, it's going to get scaled down to one. So the tail is only going to move one unit. So the same thing happens for the y coordinate. And now we have sine x and sine y, which denotes the direction that the tail needs to move in. So the tail here is at tx comma ty. dx and dy is, are going to be unit um, units, like either one or negative one or zero, describing um, you know what direction the tail needs to move in. So after that, we can update the position of the tail according to these signs, and that's it. That's it for a move function. Now we know that where we, when we move the head in a certain direction, where the tail needs to go, and then we can update those variables. Okay, now we actually just need to parse the input, and this is the easier bit. Um, we just need a map describing all of the possible directions that the head can move in, and actually write them as numbers. So right is going to be 1, 0, up is going to be 0, 1, left is going to be negative 1, 0, down is going to be 0, negative 1. I realize I'm pointing in the opposite direction relative to the camera, um, just mirror whatever I did for left and right. Okay, so next thing we're going to do is we're going to go through all of the lines, and then we're going to simulate everything. So first of all, we take the operation, which is either left, up, right, or down, as well as the amount that the head needs to move in inside that direction. Uh, so these are going to be strings once we split a line um, by that space. So we need to turn the amount into an integer. Um, and then the next thing we do is we just extract the direction that the head is going to move in using this dictionary, because left, right, up, and down do not correspond to vectors initially. So after we've turned that into the direction that the head needs to move in, we can update the head. And this will also automatically update the tail for us because of that encapsulated function that we wrote earlier. At this point, we're going to add the current position of the tail to a set that describes uh, where all the all the positions that the tail has been in. And we initialize that up here. I skipped over that previously, um, but we have a set that describes all the positions the tail has been in. Um, initially, we're going to add 0, 0 to it just to make sure we don't not count it. So as we're going through all of those units. Um, you can see down here eventually the head does move quite a lot. So for example here it moves up 15 units and we're going to move the head a total of 15 times using this for loop just to make sure we get all of those positions for the tail in between. So we're going to move the head by 15 units and update the tail, um, put it into that set for all 15 moves. After we've done that we now have a set that contains all the positions the tail has been in and all we had to do is simulate the movement and track all those positions and put it into a set and now we can just print out the length of the set to get um, the total number of unique positions the tail has been in so that's it for part one um, some commentary by the way these uh, numbers don't get too big so I did scroll this through this you can probably see in the time lapse I scrolled through the input first to see how big these numbers got if they were on the order of like hundreds of thousands uh, I don't think we could do this for loop trick and just update the tail one by one. We would have to do something smarter, but this is, um, you know, still pretty early on in advent of code. So the puzzles don't require algorithms that are too yet specialized. Okay, let's move on to part two. So when I saw part two, I was pretty intimidated because this is a big step up. What we have to do with, for part two is, uh, first of all, let's read the story. A rope snaps. Suddenly, the river is getting a lot closer than you remember. The bridge is still there, but some of the ropes that broke are now whipping towards you as you fall through the air. The ropes are moving too quickly to grab. You only have a few seconds to choose how to arch your body to avoid being hit. Fortunately, your simulation can be extended to support larger ropes. So we're in a bit of danger now. Um, we need to simulate longer ropes. What we have to do is get 10 knots instead of just two knots. So the same um, theory works. We still have a head of the rope, which is going to move according to our instructions. And uh, every knot, every subsequent knot after the head follows the previous knot, previous knot's uh, movement. So it's like we're simulating a head and a tail, except just repeated 10 different times. Um, Eric even gives us the warning, be careful, more types of motion are possible than before, so you might want to visually compare your simulated rope to the one above. I decided not to do that because I wanted to be fast, so that's probably not good practice, but 
um, it worked, so I'm not going to complain about it. So you can see here the rope is moving in pretty advanced ways. Um, you know, it can create pretty cool shapes. But all we have to do for this simulation is we can pretty much just reuse our code. So our function for move was really helpful. What it did was it took in a position change of the head and then updated the position of the tail. So that can all stay the same, mostly. Um, but what we're going to do instead of just having a head and a tail is we're going to have a list of 10 knots. Each knot is described by an X and Y coordinate, and we're going to change these positions of the knots over time. So our move function just needs to be updated a little bit. So all you have to do is first, the head is going to be the zeroth element of this list. We're going to update it just by adding the change in this function. So again, here, we're just updating the function to move all the knots according to a given movement of the head. So here, we're just updating the movement of the head. We're now going to uh, iterate through the rest of the knots. So we have the same sort of concept as before. We have a head knot, which might not actually be the head knot, but it might be a knot inside but it's going to be the previous knot and we're going to calculate the movement in the current knot. So the head knot is the previous knot and we just assign a variable to that by unpacking the previous element inside this knots list. And we also have a tail knot, which we're going to compute the difference for um, and sort of update, update its position. This logic is the same um, as part one. So go back and check out part one if you um, skipped it to understand this logic. So now we can know how to update the tail. All we have to do is you know, update the tail and then update the position within the knots array because we extracted it here. So we've computed how the tail needs to move. And in reality, the tail is index i inside this knots list. Uh, we update that and then we're all good to go. We just do this for all of the knots and they're gonna follow the head. For the simulation, we can literally do the same thing as part one. Um, not a lot of code has to change. You can see in part one, we added the tails position to this set and we do the same thing. We add the tail position to the set, except now it's the last element of the knots array that's going to represent our tail. And we also have to cast it to a tuple because in Python, you cannot add mutable structures to sets. Tuples are basically immutable versions um, of lists. So you can't update the elements. You can't make it longer, can't delete elements. This just makes it able to be added to a set. So we do the same thing essentially as part one. We simulate everything. We can still use the loop 10 times as in move, in the, move the head and all the knots 10 times trick. That's going to work. And at the end, we still have a set of all the positions that the tail has visited. So we can just print our answer from there. Um, in that regard, part two is pretty similar to part one. All we must do is update 10 knots instead of one, but it's still like one is following the other. So the same logic still applies. We don't have to rewrite that much, which is how I got part two um, so fast relative to part one. So part two, and the answer is 2,643, which is surprisingly less than what it was for part one. And you'd probably think that like the rope visits more positions when you have a longer rope, but Maybe it's that like the tail doesn't move as much because as you're dragging around the head, the tail doesn't necessarily move um, because its previous things might be touching. You might imagine it going around in a sort of circle and the tail's not going to move. So I guess it does make sense that the tail is going to visit less positions when you have a longer rope. Okay, so that's it for day nine of Advent of Code 2022. You can check out the art. Um, it does look pretty cool here. We can see the, the rope is sort of simulated. And today's puzzle was a bit more challenging maybe than yesterday's. What was yesterday's again? Uh, let, let me remember. Oh, it was the tree calculation. Okay, I think for this one, people were just able to do it much faster, which is why I didn't get on the leaderboard. It may be conceptually easier, but I don't know. Um, let me know in the comments what you think about the difficulty of today's puzzle with regards to um, previous day's puzzles. Okay, so I'm happy that I did get onto the global leaderboard today. That's the thing very proud of. Um, it turns out the fastest person solved both parts in six minutes, which is uh, a bit slower than yesterday's, I think. Yeah, usually people get it in just a couple of minutes. Today's uh, probably took a bit longer than usual. Um, so this person got 14 minutes, rank 100, very fast still, um, but just goes to show today's was maybe a little bit more challenging, not perhaps as challenging as like day seven, maybe that was the um, directory moving around one. I don't know. Let me know in the comments. So yeah, that's it for day nine. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, feel free to leave it in the comments below. And I hope you enjoyed the explanations. I'll see you tomorrow for day 10 of Advent of Code 2022. Thanks for watching.